message for today is entitled As the World Turns, uh, The Nature of Prophecy. But in lieu of the day we have coming up in celebration of, of Dr. Martin Luther King, I would just like to share one quote, one quote with you. It won't be on the screen, but it's a, it's a very uh, a popular one. It was a time when he said it. He stated, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Just let that sink in. Everything we've seen over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of years, let's stick with love. Amen. Amen. As the world turns, the nature of prophecy. Let's step into the, the, the time of Christ and, and one of the, 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 the most important sermons that Jesus ever shared, the second longest sermon that Jesus ever shared. It's, it's termed the, the Olivet Discourse, but we're going to step right into it as the disciples are speaking to Jesus and, and they're sharing something with him and they were shocked and distraught at Christ's reaction to what they share. The Bible tells us as Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, this is again in Matthew 24, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. They wanted to show Jesus how beautiful the temple buildings were. And he responded to them by saying, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished and not one stone, not one stone will be left on top of another. You can imagine the disciples didn't want to hear this from Jesus. This is not what they expected. They were talking about the, 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 the beauty and the craftsmanship and the architecture. And for Jesus to come right in at this moment and tell them that as beautiful as it is, none of it will stand in the future. The Bible says that Later on, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and his disciples came to him privately because you could only imagine this was on their mind. And they said, tell us when this will happen, Lord. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Now, we've got to understand the mindset here. The mindset of this, the disciples was of such that if Jerusalem would be destroyed and no stone would be left unturned, then it had to be the end of the world. There's no other way. There's, there's no other explanation for, for what could go on. It had to be the end of the world. And they were thinking about this thing. And they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, when will these things be? The Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 is, is the prequel, if you would, to the prophetic uh, tone and, and discourse that we find in, in, in Revelation when Jesus was speaking to John and Sharon. The Olivet Discourse is extremely important to understand and to just get an idea about before we delve into Revelation 13 and that beast with his two horns that looks like a lamb but speaks like a dragon, that beast which we understand is the United States of America. And before we look into America's place in history, we've got to discover as Jesus was sharing with his disciples and for us throughout the ceaseless ages, what would occur in the last days? Olivet Discourse is extremely important to understand this. And first and foremost, we have to frame it with this fact, brothers and sisters, prophecy is divinely inspired. Prophecy is divinely inspired. If you believe me, if you agree with me, not if you believe me, if you agree with me, just give me an amen. We've got to start there. Prophecy is divinely inspired. That means that prophecy can only be given by God or to men from God for us to hold it dear and to apply the way we live from what we hear. That means you just can't go listening to everybody trying to prophesize. <laughs> do, do, do you understand that? 
some of us are, are, are might be a, a little confused about, about that, but 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 you see, we, we've got to understand it, brothers and sisters, because that means just because somebody is telling you what they think is gonna happen in the future doesn't mean that's what's gonna happen in the future. If somebody tells you that they're gonna build a wall down the whole southern area of the United States. Don't be surprised if it doesn't happen. Everyone calm down, relax. I don't want to get anyone uncomfortable. We've got to understand prophecy is divinely inspired. It comes from God or it comes from an individual that's been connected with God. And that's important to understand, brothers and sisters, because there are so many times when we've got somebody in our ear talking about they know what's going to happen for us or to us, and they haven't talked to God or anybody else. It's just observing things in your lives. You know that I've shared with you the, the, the many uh, prophetic encounters that I've had. The, the, the prophetic encounter I had with E.E. E. Cleveland, who told me I was going to be in ministry before I even thought about ministry. And because I was raised respectful, I smiled and I nodded at him as I walked away laughing. And when I found myself in the second row of evangelism class, three years later, he got the last laugh. <laughs> Divinely inspired. Let's look at this. The Bible tells us this. It says, remember the things I have done in the past. This is our scripture reading. For I, am al I alone am God. For I alone am God. I am God. There is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish, because, again, I'm God. Look at what Peter tells us. Because of this experience, the experience of working for Christ, of doing things for Christ, we have an even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. And Christ, the morning star, shines in your heart. Above all, you and I must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, these prophets, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Prophecy is divinely, prophecy is divinely inspired. Best beware of individuals that claim to be prophetic and they don't have a relationship with God. Case in point, this week, and I'm not going to give his, his, his name any advertisement, and I, I, I showed this at prayer meeting, and, and we giggled, and at the same time, we were a bit alarmed. Uh, uh, this week, uh, this gentleman here during an altar call decided to prophesy on the lives of individuals that, one, tried to steal a vote, and two, that were impeding government progress. What? Did you hear that? And, and what he said in this prophecy and this that was cloaked in a prayer was that if you tried to help steal the vote, then, 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 then he wishes and he prophesies that this upcoming year, you won't have money. He wants famine on your food and your resources and sickness on your body. And if you're a government official, he asks, for the, the constituents to rip you out of your place and also for you to never serve in government again. And brothers and sisters, this was quite a scene. This wasn't just a few people here. This place was packed. They were shouting amen and he continued to go on. That prophecy is not from God. Prophecy is divinely inspired, brothers and sisters, and we better make sure that it is coming from heaven down into earth, into our hearts and our minds, so that we can explain and share for our brothers and sisters so it can help us in these last days. 
I say that especially for us as Seventh-day Adventists because we are a church with a rich, apocalyptic, a historical nature. It's in our veins. It's in our blood. We are prophetic in, 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 in our understanding of things, brothers and sisters. And sometimes, sometimes because of our understanding of prophecy, because of what we recognize in prophecy and how we share it or preach it or teach it or, or, or pass it out through pamphlets, we lord over individuals with our information instead of trying to help individuals with the information shared. We were together when COVID first hit. You heard me mention some things that 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 I, I noticed going on from, from, from some of our ministers. And, and there were there were men much more accomplished than I am with several doctorates and PhDs that, that warned our churches about this because everyone was online and they warned that we need to beware of those peddling prophecy and causing fear-mongering among us. There's enough prophecies in the Bible for us not to have to make up a prophecy to put COVID in it. Somebody give me an amen on that. We had brothers trying to preach things, sisters trying to preach things, put in places, putting things in places and events in places that did not belong and did not exist. And dare I say, brothers and sisters, that I feel as the word tells me to try and test the prophets that that could not have come from God. We don't need to have to explain everything. We just need to understand what God is trying to share with us. One of the best things I noticed this morning in our Sabbath school when we were talking about it, and Ellen White says this, she says this very clearly. She says, in describing the nature of Christ, silence is golden. We will go in circles trying to chase our tails, trying to figure out and describe the humanity and divinity of Christ being one in unison for our salvation. This created the first great schism in the Christian church. Folks spent too much time trying to handle it when they need to recognize that he was divine enough to lay down his life and cover us for our sins and human enough to go ahead and live a life without sin so that we might have the privilege to do it as well. Got to make sure it comes from on high. Prophecy is defined divinely given. It's something that comes from God. It's something that comes from God speaking through individuals. And brothers and sisters, what we have to understand as well, prophecy can also be local. Prophecy can also just be for you as an individual. Prophecy can also be given to a family or to a church. These things can occur here, but the main issue and criteria is that it comes from God. I'm going to share something that I've never preached about publicly and speaking about the prophetic nature of things I've heard in my life towards me. It's not my uh, mind to share what was told to everyone else, but 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 just for me, there was a, a, a woman that my dad uh, baptized in his first ever, his first ever crusade in 1980 in Brooklyn, New York with the Lighthouse Tabernacle Church. She became a family friend that was with us throughout everything that transpired in our lives. And, 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 and sadly, uh, a, a, a cancer had gotten a hold of her body and, and, and she was on her deathbed and she was worried about our family. And again, it's not my business to talk about everyone else's business, but I'll talk about my business. I was not in the church. I was not where I should be for God. And she said, as she was closing out her earth's history, that she was praying for us as a family. And she was pleading for us as a family. And the Lord shared with her some things for my mom, some things for my dad, some things for my sister, and said, and don't worry about Stephen because God has called him to ministry and he will labor with you in these last day times preaching the word of God. And every time I think about the details of that 
and the details and the, 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 the depth of how it was shared, tears overwhelm me most of the time because my God loves me so much that he had to share a message while my ears were closed and my eyes were blind to get me to understand that my life didn't have to remain where it was at that time. He had a purpose and a future for me. Sometimes we get prophecies to understand that we don't even get now. And my mind couldn't even comprehend that yet. And I put it in the back of my mind. And then when E.E. E. said what he said, I put it in the back of my mind with brothers and sisters when I found myself back at Oakwood College, studying theology, going through the, 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 the trek that I had to go through. All these things came to my mind when I was struggling studying, when I was struggling with work and with classes, when I was struggling wondering if I was going to find a job. And these things came to my mind. And I realized that I was in God's hands because he had prophesied that I was going to work for him. It's divinely appointed. It comes from God. One thing we've got to understand as well, prophecy provides comfort. I want to do something like we would do at church. Just say comfort back to me. I can see you. Comfort. Prophecy provides comfort. And we've got to understand what that means when it provides comfort. You see, a lot of times in scripture, when prophecy was given, it was given because the folk that needed to hear it needed comfort. Adam, where's your wife? Wife, where's Adam? Why are y'all hiding? What's going on? The woman you gave me, the serpent you made, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear all that. I've already got a plan. You're scared. You're frightened. You don't know what's going on with the feelings in your life right now. But I've got a prophecy for you. Your seed will overcome and you will live again. Comfort. The first gospel, Genesis 3, 15, was a prophecy of comfort because it came out of chaos. But it wasn't new to God because God doesn't operate like that. God is working on a different time plane. If he's even dealing with time, he revealed it to them so that they could understand that it was going to be okay. But just like he had to warn us in Matthew 24, which we'll go to, he probably should have told Adam and Eve that they don't know the day or the hour and your first baby is not going to be the Savior. When Daniel got the prophecy in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 9 and in Daniel 12, Daniel was distressed because he had been passed from different regime to different regime working while his people still were distressed. And as he continued to pray for his people, the Lord said to him, Daniel, your people are going to be okay, but let me show you what's going on in the world until I come back. Comfort. When Jesus said to the disciples, not one stone is going to be left unturned. Jerusalem is going to be in shambles. Look around now and think it looks good. Oh, it's not going to look like this anymore. Prophecy was about to provide comfort. Comfort. Jesus tells him like this. He says, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end, the end won't follow immediately. I'm providing comfort for you. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to be difficult to deal with. There's going to be warring nations. There's going to be issues throughout history, but relax. 
The end won't follow immediately. Brothers and sisters, Jesus expertly took the disciples from the time of the destruction of Jerusalem all the way to the time of the end of the world in a careful sermon that was an expertise of prophecy because he was God. He says, look, nation is going to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is just the first of the birth pains with more to come. Now, could you imagine the disciples are sitting on this hillside and Jesus already told them that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Then he's talking about wars and rumors of wars, and they can't even really fathom that because Rome is in charge of everything. And then he's telling them that there's going to be famines and pestilence and, and earthquakes, and it's just the beginning. Hold on, Jesus. How is that comfort? <laughs> He says, then you will be arrested, you will be persecuted, you will be killed, you will be hated all over the world because you are my followers and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Hold on, Jesus. You're telling me my fellow Christians are going to turn on me. You're telling me that things such as politics and, and equality and justice are going to turn us against each other in the last days. How is this comfort? He says, many false prophets will appear and they will deceive many people. Sin will be so rampant everywhere that the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. I love the way the message Bible says it. It says sin will be everywhere. Sin is going to be everywhere and love is going to run out. He was saying that to the disciples. He's saying that to us now. But again, if prophecy provides comfort, Lord, how in the world is that comforting to know that love is going to run out? Have we noticed that love is running out? Have we noticed that there seems to be a lack of humanity and how we operate with each other. How we have we noticed that when the mob gets together and group think takes over, that the, the, the atrocities and, and the evils and the violence that we're willing to, to do to each other as human beings for political gain or for, for righteous indignation with which we want to call it or for whatever is the cause. Do you see how we can just do it at a drop of the dime? That's love running out. But even still, we started this by saying, hold on, but prophecy provides comfort. How is this comfort? Well, because Jesus doesn't end it there. Jesus tells them right in the following passage, he says, and the good news, but hold on, love is going to run out. But the good news, the good news of salvation, the good news of my sacrifice, the good news of my impending death, the good news of my resurrection, the good news of my second coming, the good news about the kingdom is going to be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. Comfort! Pastor, why is that comfort? Well, brothers and sisters, first of all, it tells us that it's not going to last forever. Woo! Sometimes it feels like evil and, and, and destruction and hatred and sin were going to last forever, and we're just going to be plagued with it for a time. But Jesus says here in verse 14, it's not going to last forever because the good news is going to be preached. So that's another thing of comfort, brothers and sisters. Despite the atmosphere and the lack of love and the lack of kindness and forgiveness and the lack of empathy, there's still going to be somebody spreading good news. <laughs> oh, Lord, let it be me still spreading that good news. Let it be you still spreading that good news. Let it be us as a church let it be us as a denomination. Let it be us as a, a people still spreading the good news to a world that sees love running out. That's why you've heard me say it time and time again. When Jesus told his disciples, and he told us as well, he said, by this will all men, women know you are my disciples if you have L-O-B-E for one another. 
That's why it's so important, yes, to evangelize outside. And you're going to get sick of me saying this, but until we get it right, we've got to keep talking about it. We can evangelize all we want on the outside and try to reach people all on the outside. But if we are hating each other and undermining each other and trying to, to, to discourage each other with our actions, with our words, with our glances, with all those things that go on in a church around people that have been together for many years, brothers and sisters, that's not showing the love that God wants us to show to the world. If the world is running out of love and there needs to be a beacon of love for all to see, and he's telling his disciples and us that we need to be that beacon of love, then we've got to start loving each other like we should. Stop talking about folk. Stop undermining folk. Let's start holding hands in unison and saying, Lord, your will be done. Because the comfort of prophecy lets us know that despite the evils that will prevail, despite the miasma of sin, that scent will, will look to overcome the senses of God's people, the end will not come until the good news is preached and then God will say enough. That's comfort. You know how exciting that is? That's like when your team is getting beat bad in a game and you're just saying, Lord, please, let's this game get over with. That's comfort knowing it's gonna end. That's like having some work that you've got to do and it's hot outside and you're struggling, but you know you have responsibilities and you got to fix it. And you're saying, Lord, please help me get this thing done. It's comfort at the end when it's done. Brothers and sisters, this journey that we're on, this spiritual walk that we're on, despite the, 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 the potholes and, and bullets that, that are put in our way, they may seem to be overwhelming. They may seem to be insurmountable, but the comfort of prophecy lets us know that God is still in charge. He still has a good news to be shared. He's looking for folk to share it, and all of this evil will cease. Comfort. We need comfort more than ever right now. Global pandemic going on. Seems as though we've been in our third or our fourth quarantine stay at home order. Every time we hear the numbers, the numbers don't make sense. Every time we hear the death numbers, the death numbers don't make sense. Every time we hear of another individual closer to us, it, 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 it's becoming uh, uh, too regular where, where it went from individuals that you may have known to individuals you may have seen to individuals you do know to individuals you've smiled with and sung with and occupied the same space with. They are being snatched out from among us due to this pandemic. But despite all of this, there's still comfort because God is still in control. You say, Pastor, how do you see it as comfort? Well, it's not just that a vaccine is coming. That's comfort and provides hope, uh, uh, hopefully. But, but, but the comfort that I see as a pastor is, is what I see in the fact that we're still together worshiping. We're still able to praise the Lord. Our Sabbath school is able to go on. We need to do better with, with, with our, our children and, and our young adults. We, we can do better and get more imaginative there. And brothers and sisters, believe you me, we are praying for that. But the comfort is there that we haven't been lost. We haven't been scattered. We are still wrapped in God's arms as a specific community of faith. And God is still leading us. There's comfort in that. There's comfort in his protection from the virus and his healing from those who have gotten the virus. There's comfort in that. Look at the, the, the virus. We can't even get enough of that on our minds with brothers and sisters. Then we got to deal with all this political upheaval we have going on. 
Say, Pastor, how do we get comfort in that? How do we find comfort in this? The only thing that I could say, brothers and sisters, is that we know that God is in charge. I don't have answers to this. Because the more I read, the more I am disturbed at the things that are being shared. The more I read, the more my heart just skips as I realize the depth, the depth of the evil being presented. Congressman Ayanna Presley, she shared this week that she was fearful for her life and she returned to her office with her staff. And when her chief of staff reached for her panic button in her office, her panic buttons had been ripped out of place. Now you're familiar with her. She, along with three other Congresswomen are described as the squad. She says that she understands that, 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 that the protocols of security because she has many death threats that are thrown her way. And so she's used the panic buttons many times before and she got in her office and the panic buttons before folk had gotten in had been ripped out. I don't know what to do with that, but just to say God is still in control. We've been told that it was about the police officers and Blue Lives Matter, and there are very good, ethical officers of the law throughout our country. So we don't ever want to be confused and fall into the trap and say, just because one is one way, they're all a certain way. No, we don't want to do that because we get enough of that done to us. But brothers and sisters, when I read that over 20 Capitol Hill police officers are under investigation and the badges that were flashed and the military IDs that were flashed and the off-duty and on-duty police officers from, from around the country that were a part of these riots. And when I hear in my mind those that have gone before me historically, such as Dr. King and other leaders in the Black community that have tried to express to the world the depth of bigotry and the systematic means with which authority is battered onto the minds of those that are brown and the bodies of those that are brown. We've been saying this for decades. And yet now, because it was revealed, folks are acting surprised and brand new. What? And I look at this thing and I say, Lord, what in the world can we see here that will provide comfort? And he just continues to say to me, he continues to answer my prayers and lets me know it's not for you to be worried about and stressed about. I am still in control. I am still on the throne. I am still watching over you and keeping over you and watching over my people whom I love. Everything works out according to my plan. You just trust me. And so as I read those things, I say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And as I see these things on the news, I say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. But boy, oh boy, is our country in distress. Prophecy is divinely given. Prophecy provides comfort, brothers and sisters. Prophecy reveals signs of hope. Woo! Hope. <laughs> hope. You see, there's a difference between comfort and hope. Comfort, comfort is when your mother grabs you and picks you up and tells you it's gonna be okay. It's just lightning. Don't worry about it. Mommy's here. I'm going to take care of you. That's comfort. She's comforting you. But hope, hope is. And the next time that lightning comes in the future, my child, you come next to mommy. You come next to daddy. And however you may feel about it, we will give you hope that it's going to be okay with our loving arms. Comfort takes care of what we're going through in the present and hope says that if it happens again and if something bad occurs again and if there are potholes in our way that God himself will come in and take care of us. Whew. 
Prophecy reveals signs of hope. Brothers and sisters, what's the sense in understanding 538 to, to start uh, the, 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 the Dark Ages and, 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 and 457 to start the 70-year prophecy and the 2300-day prophecy and, 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 and Revelation 13 and the first beast being a combined figurative picture of the beast from Revelation uh, from Daniel 7 and, and, and all of these things. If we don't understand what it does for us in our day-to-day -day walk, Prophecy reveals signs of hope. Let's look at this. Whew, gotta move faster. So if anyone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding there, don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so will it be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. We are not to get caught up in the signs. We are to take note of the signs and recognize that the signs are revealing to us that soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hope. Jesus went even further because he says, you know what? I understand how folk are. Jesus understood the hearts of men. He understood how we would be. He recognized how in 2021, with everything going on around us, we needed concrete stuff. We needed things to say, whoa, 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 Lord, show me this and show me that. And he doesn't kowtow to show us signs because he has to do it for his part. He does it for our part to recognize, to, for us to recognize the hope that he reveals. And look at what he said here in Matthew. 24. He says, immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. In Revelation 6, it tells us this, I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became dark as black cloth, and the moon became red as blood, and then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree, shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Jesus, what are you talking about? The disciples had to mention, but because he was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end times, here he's speaking directly to us. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth will all be signs that my coming is soon. May 19th, 1780, the sun was black in the sky. The description that is historical given during that time says individuals felt as if it was a type of living darkness and there was no light that could quench it. That night, the moon became red like blood. And it's funny, when you read the historical accounts about it, because you're trying to find somebody that maybe got it, right? Somebody that maybe understood it. All you see is scientists and the like, and not that there's anything wrong with scientists, they absolutely have their place, but they try to explain away what Jesus said in Matthew 24, in Luke 21, by saying it must have been from smoke and from haze and other things. No, my brother, no, my sister, no, Mr. Scientist. God had told his people what was going to happen before it happened, and these are just benchmarks to let us know that again, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. But that's not it. Look at this. It says November 13th, 1833, the day the stars, the, the evening and morning that the stars fell. Historical accounts suggest that the brightness from the stars, the meteors that were falling, was so bright that you could read the newspaper on your porch. Somebody that we know Somebody that we learned about, he went ahead and got it because he understood it. Because guess what? Guess what? God loves black people. <laughs> you didn't think I was just going to say that from last week, right? No, he loves all people, but he loves black people. We saw that 
through his intervention in the Civil War for us. And we're going to see it now here. Because look at what Frederick Douglass says in the book, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. Here he is describing the scene of November 13th, 1833. He says, it was a sublime scene and a gorgeous spectacle, a harbinger of the coming of the Son of Man. Talk that talk, Frederick Douglass. You knew that Jesus was coming again. I was suffering very much in my mind. I was looking away to heaven at the rest denied to me on earth, and I was prepared to hail him as my friend and as my deliverer. Frederick Douglass felt the comfort and the hope given to him through the signs that Jesus had revealed in his word. That's a historical figure. He got it and he understood it. And that's because Jesus, God, the Godhead, loves black people and don't let anyone make you think differently. Like we said last week, Daniel prayed for his people. Daniel pleaded for his people. Daniel cared for his people. There's no difference for us pleading and caring and wanting justice for our people. We want it for all people, but we want it for our people. I wish everybody a happy birthday, but as the Samuel shared, they had two birthdays this week. You sang happy birthday to those specific people. Sending, saying happy birthday to those specific people doesn't put down anyone else's birthday who wasn't on that day. It's just not their day. <laughs> leave that alone. I'm, I'm not going to leave it alone, but I'm going to leave it alone for today. <laughs> the lips and earthquake. The Lipson earthquake of, of, of November, November 1st, 1755, was a dramatic uh, example of destruction. We saw this mentioned in, in Revelation chapter 6. This earthquake started fires, shook up that area in Portugal, caused tsunamis. It was just a terrible destruction. All stated by God beforehand as signs that my coming isn't right then. The sign doesn't mean I'm coming. The sign means that I'll be here soon. Brothers and sisters, you got to ask yourself the question. Oh boy, 303. You look at these dates just like I look at these dates and you realize that all these things have come to pass. They happened already. So right now, we are living at a time where these beginning signs that Jesus has stated to us in Matthew 24 and in Revelation 6 have occurred already. Then Jesus says this, and then at last, the sign that the Son of the Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming, coming in on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know the summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near right at the door. Now I look at that thing and I say, man, what does that mean? I mean, 1833 is the last thing we saw here. What are we describing at the door? Well, first of all, brothers and sisters, we know that God doesn't operate on our time. Next thing we know, brothers and sisters, that the Bible tells us is that he's not being slack in his promise of return. No, 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 he's not being slack. He's delaying so that we can get it right. Those family members we're praying for, 
those loved ones we're praying for, those things that we are praying for in our lives to release, we are given moments at this time to get those things right as we see the signs around us occurring. God is being merciful. But he tells us, brothers and sisters, he says, I need you to recognize these things. If you're so good at seeing signs for everything else, please understand the signs that you see here. We see those arches, we know it's McDonald's. We see that seal, we know it's Starbucks. We see that check, we know it's night. We see those three lines, we know it's Adidas. There are things that we are taught to see just like that. We have been taught throughout uh, the, 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 the means of, of advertisement to obviously know what those signs are. Brothers and sisters, the Bible is there to provide for us a prophetic viewpoint of what will happen in the future, what has happened in the past to let us know that there are signs that have occurred and we need to check mark them and live our lives accordingly. Leads us to the last point. Last point, and we're, we're, we're working, I understand. I, I can smell your chickettes and, 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 and your, 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 your beans, your, your beans for your hay snacks. I can, I, can I can smell it, smell it through the internet right here, right? It says, prophecy reveals our life guidelines. Now this one is important because what's the sense and understanding it comes from God? <clears throat> What's the sense in understanding it provides comfort when we're going through it right then? And then hope to know that even if there are more difficulties in our path, it's going to be okay. We've got to understand that with all that knowledge, we've got to. <laughs> now, Nadia in the, in the chat wants me to go ahead and preach a sermon, right, on the health message. Nadia, this isn't the day for the health message sermon. I said chickettes because I'm just saying chickettes. I know how folk get down. I've been to dinners where everyone says they're vegetarian, but then they say, we're just going to put a little chicken out and all of a sudden, all the chicken is gone, but no one eats meat. I've been to those things. So I understand, okay, maybe it's not chickettes for you, but it's chickettes for somebody. And truth be told, if we understand the health message as best as we should, we should probably even get off the fake meat. <laughs> I appreciate that you appreciate a sense of humor. Thank you for sharing that. Prophecy reveals our life guidelines. It reveals the things that we need to do. And Jesus let us know some of those in Matthew 24. You see, we are going through guidelines now. It should be very easy for us to understand that in our Christian walk. We are wearing masks. We are washing hands. We are keeping distance. We are doing all the things as best as we could to counteract this virus and to prevent its spread to us or to someone else. And so Jesus through prophecy of Matthew 24 is letting us know that there are life guidelines for us to follow. He says, let's read it. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels or heaven or the son himself. Only the father knows when the son of man returns, it will be like in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up until the time that Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. And understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming. Now, I'm sorry. Y'all pray for me. I can't resist this. If the capital knew exactly when people were coming. <laughs> might have had more security. But Jesus says, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, even though... Sorry, I got to go back there. You knew this was coming because somebody told them to go there. Mm. 
But back to this, understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, not half the time, not part time, not just on Sabbath, not just during an hour at prayer meeting, not just when you do your worship. You and I must be ready all the time for the son of man will come when least expected. And how dare we be surprised or he come when we least expected when he's given us. So many signs. So when we look at those guidelines, brothers and sisters, the prophecy guidelines that we could have, one, don't pick a date. Stop picking a date. Stop trying to predict it. God is going to come on his own time. I was at Oakwood University. It was Oakwood College at the time, I believe. Can't remember. I was there when there were individuals in the theology department, people that I studied with, that, 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 that left school and moved to the mountains of Tennessee because Jesus was supposed to come, it was prophesied by a preacher, was supposed to come in the year 2000. And they, they, they left school, they took their families, they moved to the mountains of Tennessee because the date had been set. They ridiculed all of us who stayed at Oakwood, all of us who stayed in Huntsville, because by being in the Tennessee mountains, they would be closer to Jesus when they were caught up. <laughs> this isn't hearsay. I lived it. I was there. And when January 1st happened, January 2nd happened, and then the 3rd happened, and and then they came back to, to ask if they can get back in the class. And, and then they came back to ask if they could get their jobs back. And, and then they came back and they had to sort of back off uh, uh, some of the things that they had said to people about why are you still staying in Babylon and don't you see the signs? And, and, and they had to re uh, 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 understand. They had to, to understand uh, just what prophecy was about and not miss the point that Jesus said, don't pick a date. I've seen it. Second thing we see in these prophecy guidelines, brothers and sisters, is we sh cannot get caught up. Don't get caught up in the world. Don't get caught up in church busyness. Don't get caught up in, 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 in situations that get your minds off of Christ. Don't be caught up in idolizing political figures, sports figures, entertainment figures, pastors. Don't get caught up in the reverie of the world that you don't see the signs. And last but not least, get ready be ready, stay ready, as if your life depended on it. Prophecy guidelines. Proverbs 29, 18 in the Message Bible tells us this. If people could, can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. Brothers and sisters, we have no excuse for stumbling because God keeps revealing. Amen. There's no excuse for God's children to stumble because he's revealed to us what's going on. It says, but when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. So I am claiming God's blessings and I am asking for him to keep my eyes open spiritually so that I can see what's going on around me. Stay ready. Be ready for his coming. Last but not least, my favorite scripture in the Message Bible says this, Jesus speaking to his disciples as they were stressed out, I told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured. Woo! Unshakable and assured, comforted and filled with hope because I said it. He said, I want you to be unshakable and assured and deeply at peace. Deeply at peace. That's the type of peace that, 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 and forgive me for saying this, but that our seniors and our old folk have. You ever talk to a senior and talk to some older people that have lived some life, that have understands what, have understood what life has thrown at them, have seen it all, been through it all, and seen God care for them through it all, how they operate? They aren't stressed. They aren't worried. 
Matter of fact, the most you might get out of them is a child, you better give it to Jesus. Baby, do you want me to pray for you? Oh my goodness, is that right? Have you tried giving it to God in prayer? That's a deep type of peace. That's a peace that says, you know what? Stressing hasn't helped me all these years. Worrying hasn't helped me all these years. Doubting hasn't helped me all these years. I'm at deep peace with my God because I've seen him work. So y'all go ahead and rush after the capital. That's a shame. Y'all go ahead and follow after folk that make empty promises. That's a shame. I'm sticking with God because he has given me peace. Finish this sentence, Pastor. Come on. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties, but take heart. I have conquered the world. Brothers and sisters, we have a prophetic, a prophetic voice that God has given us as a people to recite, to restore the mindset of those in our churches, of what God showed us of the signs of the last days. And we have so many different prophecies to share, but let's not get confused at this first initial thing that God has given to us. We've got to do it because God is depending on us. We have seniors and young people and children who are depending on us to share this message. We've got good news to proclaim. We've got love to project and reflect. We have got to be about our father's business. And what better way to go to work than to be armed knowing you've got directions from God, you can be comforted by God, God will give you hope in your problems and you've got guidelines to follow to make it to the end. Lord, I thank you so much for the prophetic perspective that you share with us. Heavenly Father, it's so much more than beasts. It's so much more than a day for a year. It, it, it's so much more than, 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 than those things that are there, Lord. Those are important. But Heavenly Father, we've got to remember that, that, that one of the, 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 the specific reasons that we even get prophecy is to give us that comfort and hope that we need so that we can live our lives in such a way that we can be ready when we see those things. Lord, I've talked enough. And so in prayer, I just want to say this, forgive us for our sins, enter into our lives and fill us with your spirit. Lord, help us to take accountability, to understand those things we need to let go of, to understand those things we need to begin. Heavenly Father, help us to be intentional with reaching our youth, our young adults, those that don't attend our churches anymore, our seniors, those that are lonely, help us to be intentional. Help us not to look at others to say, well, they should be doing it, but help us to realize that we are in this together. Lord, help us to study, to see what's going on around us to not be dismayed as we worshiped uh, at prayer meeting this Wednesday and shared promises to realize as so many different individuals shared the same promise that you have stated that you won't leave us. You will be with us everywhere we go. We claim that promise. We count on your prophecies, Lord. Bless us as we go through the rest of the Sabbath, Heavenly Father. Give us the peace the deep peace that we need. Provide for us the strength and the energy that we have to have to overcome those things that trip us up. Lead us and guide us, Lord, as we continue to navigate this world that continues to surprise us with this upheaval and representation of evil, Lord. Thank you for your directions, for your hope and your comfort. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.